Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Um, welcome to the Talent 100 Breaking Down the Year 12 HSC Syllabus Series for Mathematics. Um, if you don't mind, just bear with me for 30 seconds while we invite everyone into the webinar, and then we'll kick off the session. Okay, um, so good evening again. Uh, welcome, my name is Roland Tam. I'm one of the directors here at Talent 100. And we're really pleased to uh, welcome you tonight to our Talent 100 webinar titled, Breaking Down the Year 12 HSC Syllabus Series for Mathematics. Um, this webinar tonight is the second in a five part series uh, that we're hosting over the course of September. So last week we held uh, the Secrets of the HSC seminar. Um, and tonight we start on our first of four year 12 seminars uh, titled Breaking Down the HSC Syllabus, which takes a deep dive into each of the subjects that we teach at Talent, um, looks at the NESA syllabus and how to build a preparation program for your final year of school. Um, tonight, as I said, we're looking at mathematics, so maths advance, maths extension one to maths extension two. And uh, our host or presenter for tonight is David Sadler, who you can see over here on the right. Um, if you are interested in signing up for some of the other subjects that we're doing, next week we start on English, English Advance, which is being hosted by our Head of English, uh, Jenny Wells. Um, we also take a look at the three sciences next Wednesday with Craig Dates, and then finally economics uh, on with myself on the 29th of September. So sign up for those um, sessions if, if you're interested. Uh, they're all free and you can sign up via Eventbrite. Um, just a little bit about Talent 100 to start off, um, for those of you who don't know who we are. Um, we are one of the oldest and more established tutoring agencies in Sydney. So we've helped thousands of students with their HSC since 2008. Uh, we operate four physical centres in the north, in Chatswood, in Epping, in down south in Hurstville and in Burwood. Um, and we also have an online program. Um, for Term 4, obviously due to COVID restrictions, we'll be running all our programs online in Term 4, uh, but fingers crossed we'll be back in our physical locations in 2022. Uh, in terms of what we teach, uh, for the senior years, we teach English Advanced, the three levels of mathematics, physics, chemistry and biology, as well as economics. Uh, our program is run by three types of mentors. Uh, firstly, similar to David, uh, NESA qualified teachers, very experienced teachers who uh, either are retired or currently work in, the, in schools. Um, the second type of teachers that we have are PhDs or postgraduates. Uh, and finally, recent HSC high achievers. Uh, our program focuses on three sort of pedagogical repetitions. So we run weekly classes in small groups uh, in which you get that first level of uh, understanding and conceptual understanding. We then offer one-to-one -one tutorials and homework support, um, uh, supplementary to those classes, as well as providing online resources. So hundreds of question banks, practice questions, homework and topic exams, um, which is also then followed by holiday courses. So students have the option to accelerate or revise in their holiday programs at school. Um, just a little bit of a snapshot of, of, of how we operate. You can see here from the, from the pictures, small group classes, typically under class sizes under 15, or it's capped at 15. Uh, we offer one-to-one -one tutorials, uh, which are available throughout the term for students as part of their enrollment, and then private study areas in which they can access their online resources and um, go through uh, any materials they need. Uh, a, pre a presenter for tonight, uh, we're very fortunate to have not only as our head of mathematics, but also as our presenter tonight is David Sadler. Um, you can see his credentials from the slide in front of you. 35 years plus teaching experience. So apart from obviously his academic credentials, which you can see here, he's co-author of uh, six Cambridge textbooks, 
So a number of you, I'm sure, in your schools would be using the Cambridge Cambridge University textbooks as your core uh, text to follow. David is the co-author of those texts. Um, he's also previously been head of mathematics at Sydney Grammar School, and uh, is a um, is a strong advocate and leader in uh, the teaching of mathematics across New South Wales. Um, so we're very fortunate to have David speaking to us tonight about the NESA syllabus, about building resources and building programs to uh, prepare for your maths uh, program for year 12. Um, in terms of our agenda tonight, as I said, we're gonna take a bit of a deep dive into what the year 12 course is actually about and the changes that have come in since 2020. We're gonna take a, another look at how the course is actually examined. So how do you, how are your papers assessed? How is the HSC exam set? And then most importantly, what is the implications of that for you? How do you build a study program um, that caters and prepares you for what is ultimately gonna be uh, probably your hardest test you've ever done? Um, so what is the year 12 mathematics course about? And I'm gonna now ask David the question, in 2020, um, Nessa obviously introduced a new syllabus for mathematics. Why did they do that? Um, what are they trying to achieve by doing that? And what are the implications for a year 12 student um, knowing that the, the Nessa syllabus has changed? Well, the reason that the changes were made, you can hear me, can you, Roland? You can all hear oh, yeah. me? Yep. Yeah, good. good, good, good. Okay, yeah, and good evening to, to you all. And thanks for joining us. Um, our syllabus has had to change from the early 1980s to two years ago, re really. That's nearly 40 years we had the same um, syllabuses and they were getting pretty out of date and they weren't really in line with other jurisdictions like England or Hong Kong or Singapore. And so uh, NESA or the Board of Studies, as it was called then, uh, realised it was high time we made changes and, and brought in topics that are more important for university maths and engineering and other things like that, that really had been missing from our courses. So that was the motivation to update our courses. And um, what else was part of that question, Roland? I... Oh, well, what, what changes have they made? So what, what, why have they done it? And what, what are the changes that, that they made? And what, 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 what practical reasons did they do it? Yeah, the major changes, especially in extension maths, but also in advanced, uh, first of all, statistics, they've brought in lots of statistics because in the modern world, statistics is used more and more. Um, it's a branch of mathematics that we had pushed into the background in New South Wales for various reasons, but it's used by, um, it's used in, um, obviously mathematics and engineering and things like that it's used in computer science but it's also used in all sorts of applied sciences um, it's used in psychology even lots of arts courses have statistics in them in them uh, commerce and economics have a lot of statistics and with so many maths graduates going into the finance and business world these days we just had to um get up to speed in school with the basic elements of statistics. So that was something that we really had to do. And the other thing that's given a lot of prominence now is vectors. Vectors occur all over pure maths and applied maths as in engineering. And it had been missing from our courses, whereas um, these other jurisdictions that I mentioned, you know, pretty much all around the world really, uh, vectors are a big part of the mathematics courses because it's just such a central part of mathematics that we kind of had been left behind on. So, um, so it's fair to say that they've made these changes to bring more real world practicality back into the school maths. So, so, so things that um, lie in, in their professions. Well, vectors has a pure maths component as well as being uh, very much involved in applied maths as well. Statistics is the third branch of mathematics after pure maths and applied maths, where, where we'd been very quiet. Um, so it, ha it has uh, implications for pure maths and also for applied maths. And 
you know, given the current um, careers that maths graduates are going into, um, you know, that's the main motivation to bring these topics in. Okay, great. So what is the implication though for, in terms of for students? So what does it mean for content perspective in terms of each of the grades? And what does it mean? Uh, uh, does it mean falling at maths is now easier than it previously was? And, and what sort of advice would you give to, to a student who's maybe on this call who is thinking of dropping point at maths because it feels too hard? Well, what sort of advice? Okay, well, I'll start from the bottom. The maths advanced course um, is now not just a, a calculus course, it's a calculus and statistics course. Um, so there's less calculus in it than there used to be, but and, and uh, conversely, a whole lot of statistics that was never there before. But the calculus components are much the same. The course is about as difficult as it was before. And it's a pretty serious course. I mean, when you consider that about 60% of the state uh, does the standard maths course, and another 15% of the state does no maths at all in year 12, that only leaves 25% of the state distributed amongst the three courses you can see on this slide. So Maths Advance is a pretty serious course. It's not easy. And that means that the two extension courses are very demanding. Extension one has changed dramatically. There's a lot of new statistics in it. There's vectors in it. No vectors in advance. There's vectors in extension one. It has changed dramatically. So what that means is that the new syllabus doesn't look a whole lot like the old one. So the past HSC papers from 2019 and previous to that are very different. Okay, that's interesting. So what does that mean? Let's say obviously the go-to position for most students is to go and do past papers, but you're saying yeah. most papers prior to 2019 have obsolete components? What, what percentage? Oh, in extension one more than any anywhere else. Um, if you were looking at past papers to 2019 and earlier, they would not be much use. Um, you'd be lucky if half the questions were relevant to the new course. So it's very much a new course. Extension two has also had some fairly dramatic changes, only five topics now instead of eight. But the standard of difficulty, so there's, there's clearly less content but the degree of difficulty is still there. Uh, and they've introduced a, a pure maths topic on proof, which is proving to be very challenging for almost everybody. So extension two has also changed fairly dramatically. Um, the core topics are still the same, complex numbers, integration, they're still there. But yeah, I'd say the most changes compared to the old syllabus or extension one. Uh, next, there's fairly radical changes to extension two, but a lot of commonality with the old course. And maths advanced will probably have the least changes of any course in the three. But it's fair to say that, you know, there's a lack of past papers. You really have to do past papers based on the new courses. And last year, 2020 was the first year that these three courses were examined in the HSC. So okay. um, still there's still a limited amount of material out there to practice. A very limited. I, I would not advise any student to use papers from the past courses because you're always wondering whether the question's relevant and um, you're always having to make that judgment. And students don't need to you know, be in a position where they've got to make judgments about which questions they can are relevant and which ones are irrelevant. Okay. okay. Um, so my next question to you, David, is obviously the students, most of the students on this call would have just finished the year 11 topics. Mm. How does the year 11 topics flow into year 12 for advanced extension and extension two? And then um, schools are doing it in different orders. So in your experience, you know, a number of schools are sort of doing the full advanced course year 11 and 12 and year 11, and then moving on to extension topics. Um, other schools do it different ways. How, 
what advice would you give? How, how does talent deal with that? And then what advice would you give to students who are potentially doing different orders? Well, first comment would be that year 11 content is still examinable in the HSC. So whether it's advanced or extension one or extension two, year 11 content is examinable. And particularly in last year's extension one exam, there was a considerable amount of year 11 content. Year 11 flows beautifully into year 12. Year, uh, year 12 is pretty much just building directly upon year 11. Uh, the calculus in year 12 um, is built upon the foundations in year 11, and so is the statistics. And um, if you do extension, if you continue extension one or pick up extension two in year 12, you've got um, a higher degree of difficulty. Um, but yeah, there's a, a very beautiful flow from year 11 into year 12. Um, it all makes sense, it all flows. Uh, how how, how we... come schools are doing such sort of different orders then? Like how, you've yeah, obviously this is... set the talent course up in a particular way. Uh, in, doing different ways? in year 11 schools attending year 11 is fairly prescriptive and schools are um, doing things in similar orders in year 12 things are getting moved around quite a bit but you know different schools have different thoughts about what order to do the topics in very few schools would be doing year 12 in exactly the syllabus order um, I'll, I'll give you an example of why. If you look at the uh, year 12 um, new topics in year 12 extension one, proof by mathematical induction, introduction to vectors, they are two of the more difficult um, topics in year 12. So some schools um, reorder the topics based on their, the perceived degree of difficulty and same for extension two and the same for advanced. So we've got extension two here, five topics. If you look at the first topic, that is the one that's giving students the most difficulty because proof is, is the essence of higher mathematics. This is very much a pure maths topic mathematics as an intellectual exercise rather than mathematics that's applied to the physical world, which is applied maths. This is proving to be just about the most difficult topic. It's a new topic, although some of it was in the old course. And so some schools look at it and say, no, that's not where we wish to start. It's too hard. So a lot of schools are starting with complex numbers, which is number three. So there's various um, reasoning that each school will use to determine the order in which they want to do this. Okay. Now you're obviously head of mathematics at Talent. You've ordered the topics in your view in a particular way. Mm. Um, what's the rationale behind that? Yes, well, I was forced to think about it more than most people because I'm a co-author of uh, new textbooks for this course. So obviously you can't just do the topics in any order that some of the later topics do depend on earlier ones. Um, it's based really on where's a good place to start to give the students a reasonable beginning to year 12, not to sort of put them under too much pressure early on to give them material that they can digest pretty readily and leave some of the harder stuff to later. But it's just a matter of looking at the syllabus and making, de making decisions about what's the best order. But um, the order I'm using is pretty much the order that's in our Cambridge textbooks and the most reasonable order in consultation with co-authors uh, heads of department and other relevant educators who helped us um, via consultation to come up with what we think is the best order. And of course, it's not necessarily the syllabus order, but it's there's a fair correlation, but not an exact correlation. 
Okay. And what advice would you give to students who potentially are doing it in a slightly different order at school? How is the talent course still applicable to them? Well, the talent course is really giving you an advantage by going through the whole course twice. That's the first point. I mean, a student who goes through the course twice is going to be more experienced, more confident and better equipped than a student who goes through the course once. Um, the next comment would be that all of our Year, 12's math, year 12 maths teachers are, are top teachers, uh, you know, really good at the mathematics and um, in general, you don't get to teach year 12 until you've taught for a while. If you're a young teacher, you don't get to teach year 12 straight away. So they're clever enough. All of our year 12 teachers are clever enough to inspire bright students, which isn't the case across New South Wales these days with shortage of maths teachers and so on. Um, people who do well in maths at school are not that likely to uh, aspire to be teachers these days, sadly. So we can offer mentors who are very intelligent, very good at the maths and have had sufficient teaching experience to do it. But um, so you're getting to go through the course twice and that, that's got to be an advantage with, with a very good educator as well, which not all school students um, have, unfortunately. Um, especially... yeah, I think the other, the other point I would make is um, we, we do try to help students whose schools may be doing this in different orders in a number of ways. Um, the first way, I guess, is we offer holiday acceleration courses yes. and, um, and revision courses. So if, if you yes. want to accelerate in a different sort of topic order, um, mm -hmm. we do offer school specific classes. So if people are happy to set up their own class for their school, which is doing it in a different, slightly different order or mm. um, different pace, we can do that for people. Um, mm. And I guess that's also the reason we have the, the sort of one-to-one -one tutorials is to support mm. students who might be doing something slightly different at school than they are at talent, and they can use those one-to-one -one tutorials to go through yeah. whatever they're doing at school. And one more, just one final thing I would add on, speaking personally in my own Year 12 classes, I always make time at the end, even if it goes over time, um, for students to, um, you know, ask me questions about things they might be having trouble with at school. So now every week students get an opportunity to um, see me one on one or if there's multiple students from the same school, they can come and they can have time with me. So there is always the possibility of getting help when they need it with their schoolwork. And as Roland said, there's other resources as well, like the one-on-one -on -one tutorials. Yeah, and the other point I will make with regard to sort of schools potentially doing it in a slightly different order is um, to David's point about uh, sort of uh, getting that reinforcement for the first time and second time, a talent, we will finish the HSC course by the end of term two. So the topic order is such that all material or year 12 material will be completed by the end of term two which means that then you can focus you've finished all the same material by the time your trials come along and then you can concentrate on exam preparation and so um even if you're doing it in a slightly different order you always end up at the same point and and you get to the same point by the end of term two um thanks david i, I guess my next question then is around examinations and how you've been a former HSC marker, you've obviously been head of mathematics at Sydney Grammar, you've been teaching in the Nessa system for 35 plus years. How is mathematics examined? What are the band descriptors? What are they looking for in an E4 result or a band six result? Mm -hmm. And then what are the implications for students? How do they get ready for that? Okay. Well, you can see um, band six, there are six bands in any two unit subject. So two unit advanced has six ba uh, bands. Um, anyone who's aspiring towards excellence or for excellence, I should say, um, has to really be extremely well prepared to get a band six. Band six is not easy to get. In the advanced course, it's only about the top 10 to 12% that are allocated to band six. And you can see 
extensive knowledge, sophisticated reasoning, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, they're using some very flamboyant language there to describe uh, what is required. And this really is the case. It, it's only the it's only the people who really do demonstrate those abilities who get in the top band. So um, these are just nice words, though, David. What, what does that actually mean? What is extensive knowledge? How does that translate to a maths answer? Well, you can see, by the way, that there's only four bands in an extension course. Um, extensive knowledge, um, sophisticated multi-step reasoning. It just all basically means that the student has mastered the course. They're demonstrating mastery of the course. So they're very quick and reliable with the techniques in the course, the algebraic techniques and so on. And they can think mathematically. So if they're given um, an unfamiliar problem where it's not obvious how you get from the beginning to the end, they're creative enough and resourceful enough and determined enough to have a really good shot at it. And uh, that's really what we're doing in extension courses. In the advanced course, you, you can master the course without being a brilliant mathematician and without being a deep mathematical thinker. But in the extension courses, particularly extension two, yes, you have to have knowledge of the course, but you have to be a mathematical thinker. You have to be able to tackle unfamiliar problems and, and come up with creative approaches to um, get from the beginning to the end. So there's sort of two types of questions. There's, there's the ones that you look at and say, yeah, I've seen that sort of question before. I know what I have to do. I know how to get to the end before I even started. And then there's the harder questions, which you get a little bit of in advanced, a bit more of in extension one. And in extension two, the whole second half of the exam is sprinkled with parts of questions that are more or less unfamiliar. So we're looking there for the students who can you know, come up with mathematical reasoning, think under pressure, come up with creative ways to approach these problems. And these are the sorts of problems, as I said, where you start, but you're never quite sure what the pathway is to the end. You have to simply be good enough to come up with some strategies that hopefully will get you there. And that's very exciting if you can get out those sort of questions under pressure. Okay. Um, so how is the HSC actually examined? Well, that's a pretty complicated question. Sorry, just in terms of the structure. So, so what's the breakup of the 100 marks? Or what's the breakup of the 70 marks for extension one, for example? Well, in advanced, you've got 10 multiple choice questions. And then after that, you've got 90 marks worth of um, just normal response questions where you're meant to show you're working. And those questions are calibrated from very, very easy. And at the end, uh, by the end, the last, 30 or 40 marks uh, are pretty hard to, to get for most advanced students. But you've got to remember the extension one students uh, do this advanced paper as well. So there's a massive range of abilities from, from the lower ability advanced students through to the um, top extension one students doing the advanced paper. There's a huge range. So the paper reflects that. It goes from very, very easy right through to reasonably tough. But there's not that many questions. It'd only be 15 or 20 of those marks that you know come from genuinely demanding questions. Same for extension two, 100 marks, 10 multiple choice. But uh, in extension two, in the second half, as I mentioned, you've got parts of questions that are really challenging. And to get a band E4, which is the top extension band, you need around 70 out of 100 raw score to get into that band. It's a pretty wide band though. It's about the top 30% of the candidates. So that's about the top 900 out of the 3,000 or so people who do it. Get in. Look at um, the distribution of uh, the results in a moment, actually. Extension one's only a two hour exam. As you can see, it's out of 70, 10 multiple choice. 
and then the rest is um, normal response written um, questions. But there's a big difference between extension one and extension two in terms of standard. Um, the difference between advanced and extension one is, is less. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so implications for students, what is the best way to prepare for HSC mathematics? So you've written Cambridge textbooks, you've written the Talent 100 notes, you've written the Talent 100 homework, quizzes, um, resources. What is the right way to actually prepare for HSC maths? Because obviously it's a different approach that you might apply for sciences. It's a different approach that you might apply for English and economics. What is the right way to prepare for HSC mathematics? Well, the first comment would be that for most students, um, it takes a long time to become familiar with all the different ideas in the course. Uh, these courses have a lot of mathematics in them. Uh, the questions range from easy to very difficult. The only way to become familiar with the syllabus, and familiar with the course requirements, familiar with the types of questions that examiners like to ask, is to motivate yourself to do a lot of mathematics. I mean, it's stating the obvious that the more time you spend doing something, the more familiar you become with it. And uh, in this day and age where there's so many distractions for teenagers, um, there's almost part of the Australian culture in some places to, to not embrace learning, uh, to not uh, develop the habits of hard work, discipline, structure that are needed for all the top careers like medicine and law and um, actuarial work, all this sort of work. Um, mathematics is really an exemplar of, of all the, to do well in mathematics, you need to develop all the sorts of structures and disciplines that are needed to be successful in the top careers. I mean, that. Uh, I wish there was a shortcut if, if, if after all these decades of education, I'd uh, come up with some shortcuts for success in mathematics. I would have written a book and made a lot more money than I have writing textbooks. Um, you know, for 99% of students, there are just no shortcuts. Probably the only shortcut really to, to do well in maths, the only shortcut would be um, you're a genius and it just all comes so naturally to you that um, you don't have to put in as much time or effort as other people but there's not that many geniuses running around um, for most people it's just discipline motivating yourself to do lots and lots and lots of questions so that you become very familiar with all about how to apply the ideas and become very quick and reliable with all the techniques that I wish there was a shortcut, but uh, teenagers today are not always prepared to embrace this sort of disciplined approach, but that's what's needed to do well in um, year 12 mathematics. Right. So what's the kind of pedagogical approach? So you kind of see up on the, on the screen here. What's a pedagogical approach you have applied to the three repetitions? So talent obviously talks about three repetitions quite a lot. Mm -hmm. How have you applied that in the maths program? Okay, well, we, uh, oh, hang on. What's happened to the screen, the previous screen? Um, within the classes, within the, uh, the structure of the classes, we endeavor to cover theory as well as um, basic applications of those ideas in the theory, moving on to um, more difficult questions in the theory. Um, the next stage would be homework. Um, the homework is designed to take roughly an hour and a half, and it doesn't have to be done in one sitting, of course. It could be done in three blocks throughout the week or whatever. But the homework is very important. And again, some students don't understand how important it is. It's one thing to be doing questions when you have a teacher to guide you 
and to give you instant advice if you're stuck. But the next stage is to go home and try some questions for yourself and see what you can actually do on your own, see how much of it is sunk in. Then, of course, we offer one-to-one -one tutorials if a student's having problems with the homework or conceptual difficulty with the topic, they can um, meet up, they can book to meet up with one of our tutors to get some, you know, one on one exposition and assistance. So, yeah, I would say that the three things that, you know, the, 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 the three pronged approach is get as much as you can out of the, of the class make sure you do the homework. It's only an hour and a half. It's not, you know, it's not that onerous really if you're organized, hour and a half's nothing really. And then seek, you know, have the maturity and, and the awareness to, to seek help from one of our tutors if, if you've got a problem. Yeah, and you've written all the questions. So you've written all the questions for the homework. Obviously, you've written all the, the yes. questions for the weekly quizzes. Yeah. You've written all the questions for the topic exams. So every topic is followed with a topic exam that you learn. Yes. Um, and so those topic exams, obviously, testing the application and understanding of the topic that you've just learnt. Mm. Um, and those exams are then reviewed, I guess, to a full mark level as well. Yeah, there's an exam written to cover each term's work is basically how we do it. So yep. at the end of each term, um, students will be given a practice test on the term's work just to see how well it's sunk in. Yep. Cool. And well, there's the one-to-one -one tutorials that David talked about. Um, so just so people who are not in the talent system are aware, um, we offer up to four one-on-one -on -one tutorials per term. Um, and that's up to one hour. And at the moment, they're obviously done via Zoom. But when we go back in centre, they can also be taken up in centre. Um, and we also provide all our resources. This term will be online. So all the past papers you can see will be available. All the topic papers and all the notes and homework will be available online um, for students to access. Um, David, as I mentioned, Talent will finish all year 12 material by the end of term two. And then term three is dedicated to exam excellence program. Mm. Let's talk about a little bit about what that is, how you've written the papers and uh, what, what's the design behind that? Yeah, it starts with three weeks of trial preparation so that students, um, you know, get the opportunity to not only ask questions of, uh, in relation to their weaknesses, but to do some carefully written material designed to prepare them for the trials, um, which is a big ask. I mean, it's the, the full three or two hour exam in their level of mathematics. Um, you know, for extension one and two students, it's five hours of exams. So a two hour and a three hour. So it's a big deal on the first time they've confronted that. So that's a very important three weeks of preparation and then after the trials we have seven weeks well partly during the trials as well we have seven weeks and each week there's a, a an hsc standard um, exam it's called the exam excellence program so they're basically students are basically working through seven hsc standard papers in preparation for their HSC. So they're right up to HSC standard and they're absolutely crucial at this stage because students this year only have last year's past papers and some trial papers which can be accessed in our online suite of resources as well. But with, with a, a severe lack of past HSC papers, it's really important that students um, you know, I, I still have a decent suite of papers to work through. And so our exam excellence um, practice papers, you know, really get students, um, you know, striving to that level where they can achieve excellence in the HSC. Yeah, so our current year 12s who are about to sit the HSC have just done uh, exam six. And so they're now at a position yeah. where they're probably ready to sit the HSC. Oh, yeah, they, won't be, they won't be doing so for a couple of months, but 
with some mm-hmm. at this point. They're getting so much practice at, at, at all different types of questions, right through from you know, easy questions right through to very, very challenging questions where you have to think very deeply. Right. Okay. So this is kind of just a, a, a slide representing the three repetitions that David talked about and the pedagogical approach. Um, one thing I did want to show you guys, David touched on the distribution of marks um, across uh, different maths levels. Um, I guess one of the questions that students on this webinar might be having is, you know, they've just completed year 11. They're either thinking about doing four unit maths or three unit maths or potentially two unit maths, trying to work out where they head with it. Um, and the advice that I would give or, or the, 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 the purpose of putting up this slide, I guess, is to represent firstly, this is the distribution of marks into bands for three unit maths in 2019, I think it was. It doesn't differ that much year on year, but um, as you can see, sorry, from the from the chart, the distribution of marks skews towards E four, okay, um, and so kind of automatically, in terms of the way, if you complete and 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 even achieve an average mark in three and a math, you're going to skew towards an average of sort of 85 to 95 out of 100, just based on the way the marks are aligned and, and distributed into bands. So kind of automatically, and I haven't got any other subject to show you here, but if you look at some of the other subjects, the distribution of marks is, follows a little bit more of a normal distribution. Um, and so you kind of, before you even start, you've got a bit of an advantage in terms of the way the marks skew mm towards high bands for the extension maths courses. Yeah. I mean, David, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, extension two and extension one maths are the two highest scaling subjects in the HSC, except for some very small candidatures like Latin, classical Greek, maybe one or two others. And Every subject is rescaled completely and weighted based on weightings for ATAR calculation. So, someone who gets this is, even, that, this is actually even before scaling, though, David. This is just in terms of the way the marks are aligned. Mm. Well, that's scale. The, the, HS, the HSC marks are marks put into bands. So, if you get, if you're judged to be an E4, you'll end up with an HSC mark between or oh, from 90 to 100. Um, but you can still see there, and your point is absolutely correct, that, that there, is, there are massive advantages in doing extension maths if you're capable of it. Um, the reward is incredible, but people who do it deserve to be rewarded. Um, the competition is intense. Um, you have to be gifted in the first place to even really be able to attempt these courses. And there are a lot of work. It takes a huge amount of work to obtain mastery in these courses. And the rewards are there. You can see um, the band E4, um, the distribution into that band is simply a reward for, you know, succeeding in a very difficult course. Yeah. So you kind of get an advantage at the, at the alignment stage when marks are put into bands. And then to David's point, you kind of get a secondary advantage when it comes to scaling. So this, this chart represents the scaling curve. The ATARs, yeah, everything is re-scaled for ATAR calculation. Um, so you get the alignment benefit and then you get the scaling benefit here. And you can see here, if you finish in the top 50% of four unit maths, you'll get a result of 90 out of 100. To achieve the same mark, scaled mark, in two unit math, uh, so we haven't got two unit math here, but to get the same result in three unit math, you need to finish in the top 25% hmm. of, the, of the cohort. And then if you work your way across the, the line, to get the same mark in advanced English, you need to finish in the top 7%. Mm. in chemistry the top five percent so there is 
very, very significant um, advantages mm -hmm. in taking extension one or extension two maths from both a alignment perspective and a scaling perspective. Yes. So what this says is if you're in the top 50% of four unit maths in any given year, then when that subject is rescaled and weighted for ATAR calculation, you've got four units that have an ATAR or that would contribute to an ATAR of 99 plus. You only have to be in the top 50% to get four units out of your best 10 with an ATAR trajectory of 99 plus. So that's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Yeah, so the key takeaway, I guess, for students from these couple of slides is, yes, there's a huge amount of work and you need to put in, as David says, the, the, the work to achieve the, the, the outcomes in extension one, extension two maths, but the benefits are there also very clear to see. And so, and I'm sure David's probably a little bit biased in, in saying that, you know, maths is very important. Maths is critical to your ATAR result. And so you need to work hard at it. Well, quite apart from um, other disciplines that use maths um, that, that require mathematics, uh, maths graduates from Australian universities have never been more employable. They, they I mean, they, they go into so many different areas in IT, in business, in finance. Um, you know, math, maths graduates uh, have never been more employable. And, Good maths graduates, the top maths graduates are headhunted by all sorts of companies and businesses because they, they've come to learn over the years that top maths graduates are clever people who, who, whose basic intellect and problem-solving capacities translate into so many, so many areas now. That's just incredible. It's one reason that not enough of them are going into teaching because there's just so many um, attractive uh, prospects out there. Great. Okay, well, that's kind of the end of our, I guess, sort of uh, content slides that we wanted to run through. But we did want to leave a little bit of time at the end for people who have questions um, and sort of commonly asked questions to go through with David and myself. Um, so what I might do is I might just stop sharing the screen. If you guys want to put, pop into... Uh, the Q and A. Any questions that you guys have, um, and I'll pose them to David, and um, he can answer those for you. So let me get the Q and A up, and I'll ask. I'll just ask David the questions. Okay. So, um, first question, David: Are there any workbooks you recommend for maths practice, excluding talent workbooks and school workbooks? Well, aside from my own Cambridge texts and the Talent 100 notes and so on, there are other textbooks on the market um, which vary enormously. Some of them are more targeted towards the average students. Um, it, with the Cambridge books, we've tried to calibrate them to cater for all students. We have the full range of questions. But yes, there's, there's plenty of other um, textbooks out there um, other than um, the Talent 100 textbooks and termly textbooks that we give our students. And, um, yeah, there's more than enough books out there to satisfy um, the, the, the most uh, ambitious of students. Okay. Um, next question, what marks should we be striving for, excuse me, to get at least a band for... E4 in extension one. Okay, the extension one exam is out of 70. Um, are we talking about extension one students? Um, yeah, to get a band E4, the range is normally about 45 to 50 out of 70, which reflects the, facts that, the fact that these papers are, are, are quite difficult. Um, parents need to understand and students that New South Wales out of all the Australian states um, has by far the strongest tradition um, in high school mathematics. Not only are our syllabuses harder than the other states, except perhaps Victoria, 
Um, but what we do that no other state does is we set difficult questions in our exams. Even in Victoria, which is the second highest performing state after New South Wales, they rarely, if ever, put in questions that are unfamiliar. Almost all the questions are very similar to the questions in the textbooks and in the past papers. Um, the strong tradition in New South Wales has tended to come from the interest that the universities have shown in high school maths education, which unfortunately seems to be waning a little bit at the moment. But the universities have done a lot of work over the decades to make sure that the high school courses are rigorous and that people that come out of high school are ready for university maths. So to get a band E for an extension two, you're looking at about 70 out of 100, which sounds very achievable, but it's much harder than it sounds because the paper has hard questions in it in the second half. In extension one, you're looking around high 40s to 50, mid to high 40s, roughly out of 70 to get an E4. Again, it's harder to get than it sounds. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to combine the next two questions. Uh, what study techniques for maths do you recommend? And then how do you go and revise year 11 content? Uh, what to do if you want to revise the year 11 content? I'll address that first. Most of the year 11 content is revised automatically because it's required for year 12 work. So it's not true in total. There are some standalone topics in year 11 that need to be revised on their own because they don't really get used again in year 12. But most of the year 11 content uh, gets revised automatically because it's revisited in year 12 for further topics in year 12. So year 11 knowledge is needed for year 12 and it gets reinforced when, it, when it's introduced into year 12. So the teacher will say, well, you did this last year, now we're going to use that and take it further or develop it further. Uh, study techniques for maths. Study techniques is an individual thing, but the overall, um, the overarching principle is that the student, the student who's doing extension maths is competing at the top end. You're competing against motivated students who are determined to succeed, who are keen to compete, um, who, who are dedicated to what they're doing. They want to, you know, they want to see themselves get into certain university courses. They want to have a career and a top profession or whatever. So really the, the overarching principle for studying is that you have to organize your time. Now, you can't study all the time. You can't practice all the time, but you have to organize yourself so that you still have time for sport or music or recreation the things that you know make your life complete, time with friends and that sort of thing. But you have to devote significant time to study. And that means study without music. That means study without interruptions from social media and things like that. You turn everything off. I'm going to do an hour and a half mathematics. You sit there in silence and you concentrate and you work quickly and you get the job done. You don't stop and start. You don't allow distractions. You just put your head down and you do it. And you make the most of that hour and a half if that's what you've set aside. Uh, too many teenagers today are, are too distractible and they're too reluctant to set aside the quality time and push through it and get as much done as possible. It's frustrating. Um, I'm afraid. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to jump to another question from Lucy. Uh, for extension two maths, I've been told we need to be very creative and adaptive with our math skills. But how do we know if we have this mathematical thought process and can we learn it? Okay. If a student, if a year 11 extension student uh, decides to do extension two, um, it's a big step up. I mean, it's, it's more sophisticated. It's just more difficult. You, it tests your ability to think mathematically. 
So my advice for a year 11 extension student going into year 12 and wondering, have I got the, the creative skills, the problem solving skills, the natural ability to do extension two, the best thing to do going into term four, which is the first term of year 12, is to simply give it a go for a few weeks and, and just see how it feels. I mean, it's very hard to know what's possible. Um, our, our true potential as human beings is unknown. And furthermore, it's unknowable. You, sometimes people who don't quite seem cut out for extension too actually discover that they can unlock things that they never knew they had. You, that's the best thing you can do. And so you might do it for half a term, which is probably one topic, or you might do it for a whole term. And it quickly becomes reasonably clear um, whether you're whether it's suitable for you or not. Um, you know, for some people, um, they have to put so much time into it that it interferes with their learning in other subjects. Um, but the only way to find out it. If, you, if you're undecided, you've done extension in year 11, give it a go, see how it feels, and you'll quickly get the answer to your question. Okay, great, thank you. A um, couple other quick ones, David, I'm just conscious, conscious of time as well. Um, you stated that extension math subjects scale very well, would it be worth an average math student attempting it? If they end up with a lower mark around 50%, would it have been worth it to have done it? Actually, 50%, um, this we're talking about raw scores, 50%, if you were a two unit advanced student, just doing two units of maths, 50% uh, would probably put you at least halfway up the candidature. Now, it's quite common year in, year out for two unit students to average less than 50% on the two unit paper, extension one students to average less than 50% on the extension one paper, and extension two students to average a bit under 50% on the extension two paper. Uh, such is the demanding and challenging nature of our exams in New South Wales. Um, it's a hard question to answer though, because um, but I would say if you could get 50 out of 100 in the extension two exam as a raw score, you would get a band at E4 because E4 and E3, the top two bands, cover something like 70% of the candidates, roughly speaking. So it's all part of the reward system for doing these challenging levels of mathematics. So yes, 50% would be worth it. It would put you in the top half of the candidates pretty much or right on the halfway mark. And I think like you just said, look, it's worth trying you know, initially because you can always drop down, obviously. You can give it a, give it a term to, to, to see if, it, if you can make it. And then, um, you know, you've always got the option to drop it. Whereas if you didn't try, you can't obviously go back and try it again. So mm. um, set the bar higher and then you can always bring it down if you need to. I guess that's probably similar to the last question here. If I do okay in year 11 extension, like 70% mm -hmm. in the exam, but worse in advance, like 60%, should I drop extension one and concentrate more on advanced topic to improve or continue with extension? That's an interesting question. Um, there is an argument that says you're better off staying in extension because you'd be doing uh, um, some harder topics in extension, which will naturally make the two unit topics seem a bit easier. And you, you sort of, even if you're not mastering extension, it can still make you stronger and better able to attempt the advanced. But uh, something's wrong. If it's, something though is fundamentally wrong if if a student's getting 70% in their extension exam, but only 60% in their advanced exam, um, maybe the school's trying to encourage people to stay in extension so they set a, a, an, easy, an easier extension exam than they should have. Uh, conversely, maybe they're trying to scare some people out of advanced into standard math so they set a comparatively harder advanced paper but um, 
if that's happening, there are some interesting factors in play. I'd have to know a bit more about the situation because that's not normal. Okay. Um, maybe just one more question, David. Uh, Lucy asked a question. Also, if we are sitting on an extension one or advanced paper and come across a question we do not understand, would you recommend skipping it and coming back to it or just attempting it? So this is sitting in exam. Yeah, uh, what, one of the rules for exams is that you have to keep moving quickly in these maths exams. Um, you know, the advanced paper is three hours, but that three hours just evaporates so quickly. It's, it's quite ridiculous, actually. If you come across, if you're sitting in exam, is that what we're talking about here? Or are we just practicing? I think it's in an exam. We're, if we're sitting in exam and you come across a non-standard question, a question that you're not quite sure about how to navigate, how to get from the beginning to the end. You give it a go for three or four minutes, see if you can unpack it, make some progress. Um, but you, so you, you attempt every question as you come to it. I don't, I'm not an advocate for jumping around or completely jumping over questions. Give it a go for, maybe three or four minutes, see if it's getting anywhere. Sometimes you can surprise yourself. Sometimes a question opens up once you, once you actually start it and you think, oh, yes, 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 I can see what this is all about. Um, but you don't have multiple attempts at it um, in the first instance. You, you just basically, I tell students to put an asterisk next to it and come back to those questions that you couldn't get out the first time if you've got any time left at the end. But you must keep moving. You can't be obsessive and spend too long on a question. But in my opinion, nor should, nor should you just jump over it without even trying it. Okay. Thanks, David. Okay, I'm going to stop the questions there. Um, thank you, everyone, for asking for those who asked. Um, again, appreciate everyone's time for jumping on the call tonight. Really particularly thank David for his time tonight, sharing his insights. Um, obviously, got, got 35 years experience um, teaching mathematics and writing textbooks at this level. So um, David teaches, for those who are interested, he teaches in Hurstville, a four-unit class, and he teaches also in Epping, um, a four-unit and three-unit classes. Um, and oh, sorry, that's extension, that's year 11 and year 12 classes in it. Um, I've got, yeah, I can clarify that because it's it's just been locked in, I think. On a Saturday morning at Epping from 9 to 12, I have an extension two class. Um, Saturday afternoon in Epping from 1 to 4, I have an extension one class. Um, and people should know that in extension two, we in our extension two course, we only cover the extension two topics because they're long and, and they're difficult. In extension one class, we cover the advanced material as well as extension one. So we cover all three units. Right. And so, uh, in Hurstville, on Sunday afternoon from one to four, I have an extension two class. And obviously they'll all be online in term four. Yes, they will. If you want to take a class with David, please sign up for one of those. Um, just a reminder to anyone who is interested, we are running our acceleration program for maths extension in the upcoming holidays. So basically that gives people the opportunity to learn the first terms work for three unit maths in four intensive days. So it's the acceleration program. It's called our fast forward program. And any student that takes that course obviously gets access to the, the acceleration program with all the notes, the textbook and materials, the online resources, but can also utilize one-on-one -on -one tutorials throughout the term. So it's a way to kind of get that first repetition in quickly, um, do it in an intensive manner so that by the time you started at school, you've already done it. And then you can access tutorials and, and all the online resources and homework during the term. So that's a really, um, good option for people that want to take up that um, but otherwise if you want to also take a trial at talent this term please um, give our team one of a call uh, a call please one of our team a call um, and otherwise uh, sign up for the um, 
other events for English is on Monday. Sciences are on next Wednesday and economics follows that. So hopefully, um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, David, for your time particularly. No worries. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, look, really appreciate it all. And hopefully you guys have all got something out of it. So uh, we'll end the session tonight and see you guys soon. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks.